Welcome to Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute, hosted by Georgina Downer. Hello, and on today's episode of Afternoon Light, I'm talking to Dr. David Bird, who is an independent historian based in Melbourne, and he is the author of J.A. Lyons, The Tame Tasmanian Appeasement and Rearmament in Australia, 1932 to 1939. Welcome to Afternoon Light, David. Thank you, Georgina. It's lovely to have you here in the old quad at Melbourne University talking about Joe Lyons, who was Menzies' predecessor as Prime Minister, as you say, 32 to 39 in your title of your book. And somewhat of a, there has been a bit of a resurgence of interest with no doubt your book and Anne Henderson's book, but we probably should give Joe Lyons a bit more attention because he was a very important figure and quite a political acrobat. He was indeed. (laughs) And he certainly deserves or deserved more attention. He came to my attention in the 1990s when I was doing some research at the University of Tasmania on his premiership, 1923 to 28. And I realised at that time that very little research had been done on Lyons Enid, of course, had published a number of books, yes. her memoirs, and there had been a doctoral thesis in the 1960s, the ANU, which I have later consulted and which is a very good one, but that didn't lead to publication. So I felt that there was a gap there. And then when I came to Melbourne in the mid-90s and did my doctorate here at the University of Melbourne, I realised then that was the possibility of public expansion and publication of that work. Oh, fantastic. So. I always like to start at the beginning. Tell me about Joe Lyons' childhood. He's born in Tasmania, but he he has quite a a tough upbringing, doesn't he? He did indeed. It's a very interesting childhood, very much in poverty. His mother was Irish, Irish Irish-born. His father was Tasmanian-born of Irish ancestry. He was born in the northwest of Tasmania, the region from which I originated, And that region of Tasmania is quite distinct from the rest of the state. It didn't have the convict heritage that the South had, of course. It was settled by small-scale farmers, essentially. And Joe Lyons was born in Stanley, a very interesting little town in the extreme northwest. And his father was a hotel keeper. And the family were plunged into poverty in the late 1880s, the years not absolutely certain. It's either 1886 or 1887 when Joe was seven or eight. His father gambled, had a dream about a winning horse for the Melbourne Cup, bet 500 pounds on that particular horse and lost. Had a nervous breakdown and that essentially destroyed the finances of the family from that time on. And later they moved to Olveston and Joe was forced at the age of nine to into the workforce as an errand boy, essentially. However, He was rescued by two of his aunts in Stanley who offered to house him in a cottage, which one of the the two Lyons cottages in Stanley, one of them is where he was born, the other is where he lived with these two maiden aunts, as they were called at the time. And this allowed him to go back to primary school, where he was then first noticed by his teacher, a man called John Scott, as a boy of outstanding intellect and of course he then followed that path often followed by the poor at that time to become a pupil teacher and then entered the education department in Tasmania. Quite an extraordinary story against the odds. Back to his father, was he known for being a huge risk taker like that? I mean that sort of is quite a reckless thing Um, to have done. It's a rather odd thing to do. So he was quite a successful hotel keeper in Stanley. Mm. That bet Brought about his downfall, he had a nervous breakdown, he never recovered. So his influence on Joe was minimal. Joe, it's been noted by a number of people that Joe was really brought up in a a female environment. He was very close to his mother. He was the favourite son of four, I think it was. And the maiden aunts were very influential. He kept in touch with the maiden aunts right through until the 1930s. He would go back, even as Prime Minister, to Stanley and visit that little cottage where he (laughs) then was educated. So the influence of women is strong. and Very it, much. I, look, I always like Very to much. make a, a mm. comparison with Robert Menzies. I mean, we do this here often at the Robert Menzies Institute. 
where Menzies was very close to his mother, much more so than his father, and very close to his sister Belle as well. So that sort of female influence well, that's on these men. To lines as well. Mm. Yeah, his mother, as you said, was Irish born. She was quite Irish radical. I understand. Yes, she was. He was brought up with tales of the old country and absorbed some of the Irish radicalism of the old country through his mother. And there is a strain of radicalism in the early lines. I wrote one article where I referred to him a subdued radical. <laughs> okay. And I think that that's a pretty accurate description. <laughs> His radicalism was there from the beginning. When he became a teacher in the education department, he was persecuted by the Tasmanians appointed a new director general of education in the early part of the 20th century, a guy called W. Neal from South Australia, and he was very authoritarian. Joe Lyons didn't like this man at all. As a teacher, firstly, he went to the east coast of Tasmania. And as I mentioned before, the northwest was quite socially distinct from the other parts of the state. And at the east coast posting, Lyons observed feudalism that uh, was still quite common in southern Tasmania with servants people of convict stock and so on, and he did not like it. So when he went back to teach in the northwest, Smithton, quite close to Stanley, he joined the Workers' Political League. This is about 1904, 1905, and he began writing letters to the local newspaper, The Advocate in Burnie, and he would sign himself J. Lyons Education Department. This <laughs> came to the attention of W. Neal, the oh, Director right. General. The authoritarian a Very South authoritarian Australia. man who began in Lyons' own description in later years to persecute him. And that's when his mind began to turn to, if I'm being persecuted, I might as well try the chance of politics, as Haslack called it. And in 1909, he was elected to the Tasmanian State Parliament. And later, within five or six years, he actually became Minister for Education. When W. Neal was still Director General, and Lyons, actually, when he was opening the new high school in uh, Launceston in 1915, he actually praised Neal which brings us to another aspect of his personality, that he was not a vindictive man. No, I mean, he's known for being very consensus-driven, congenial, I mean, eschews partisan politics. Absolutely. Mm. And not very ideological either, despite... No, he was a practical man. He was a practical politician. Because of his experiences of poverty, he was very keen to promote the welfare of ordinary working people, although he never described himself as a socialist although he showed some interest, as many did in the Russian Revolution after 1917, he soon abandoned any suggestion of tying himself up with that because of the violence. He was a very gentle man, very humane, but as you say, not especially ideological, intelligent, but not especially intellectual. Menzies even referred to him as a simple man, which Mm. is something of a simplification (laughs) itself, but he was a practical politician, and this is an important part of his transition to the Conservative parties during the Great Depression, this idea that he was he found abhorrent some of the ideas of of an intellectual like Theodore in the Treasury in nineteen thirty one, the Keynesian ideas of expansion of the economy. Joe was a practical man who just thought that the country simply couldn't afford it. He'd been treasurer, of course, in Tasmania as Premier from nineteen twenty three to twenty eight and more or less saved the economy there. Yes, actually his Tasmanian contribution as He was an outstanding there, Premier. And obviously Treasurer is really worth noting yes. because he really did turn Tasmania around. I mean, maybe they need him again. I don't know. <laughs> well, he was an outstanding Premier and I, I t- attended one conference many years ago in Tasmania with a Labor conference and tried to suggest there that they should rehabilitate Lyons because of the quality of his Premiership from 23 to 28. That view was accepted somewhat reluctantly because he's still viewed, of course, by many in Labor as a rat. And I remember attending one Labor meeting here in Melbourne where Lyons' image appeared on the screen this conference and he was booed. This was about in the late 1990s and I thought to myself, interesting how long some animosity can last. But that premiership was where you do see the consensus in full form, this yeah. idea of collaborating with your political opponents in the interests of the state in this case and that period also witnesses, I think, the end of this radicalism where there was some suggestion that the governorship of Tasmania should be abolished and Lyons floated the idea but uh, it went nowhere and that to me is the last element of his radicalism. 
I haven't given you any notice of this question, so I appreciate you might not know the answer, but what were his views on the monarchy? Because someone who comes from an Irish background, you can obviously yes. have a little bit of antipathy towards well, the been, English. Yes, he'd yeah. been vice president of the United Irish League in Tasmania. And as I just mentioned, there was some suggestion of abolishing the governorship in Tasmania in the 20s. But as far as we can tell, he was a pro-monarchist in his period as Prime Minister. However, there are elements that when Damoned and Joe were at uh, Buckingham Palace and various occasions like that, there was some humour in just how ludicrous some of the elements of monarchy at that period were. Right. But there was certainly, he never expressed anything in public. And this is lines. in relation to the pomp and ceremony? Yes, I think so, right. and the uniform. But he found that the uniform that the members of the Privy Council were required to wear at that time with a cocked hat and uh, <laughs> stockings, apparently he and Damien had found that quite ridiculous. Well, probably with good would. reason. It was interesting reading up on Joe Lyons and Menzies, and, and we'll get to this later, of course, Menzies and Joe Lyons had a tricky relationship, particularly towards the end, that Menzies remarked that he thought that Joe and Enid enjoyed the official travel overseas a little bit too much and they squeezed the last drop out of the orange of the public purse when it came to well, you know, they enjoying the trappings of yes, position. And they certainly enjoyed it because neither of them had been overseas before, yeah. of course, which was not uncommon in that period. And the first trip that the Lions really made out of Tasmania was to a Labor conference in Sydney about the time, I think, towards the end of the First World War and they were sort of a bit overwhelmed by the size of Sydney. Neither of them ever lived in a large city. Devonport, where they settled, of course, was only about 8,000 people at that time. Canberra was mm. only a similar size. They did at various times try and living in Melbourne, East St Kilda, but they were never comfortable outside of their Tasmanian home. And they certainly enjoyed the trips overseas, 1935 and 1937, Menzies' observation is probably quite accurate. One of the election posters that Labor used showed all these UAP ministers travelling overseas and the slogan was, join the UAP and see the world. (laughs) But um, Menzies too could be accused of the same Uh, trait. I'm not suggesting that Menzies was fairly criticising Joe Lyons and Enid, but it was interesting to note that. Yes. Joe was quite a bit older than Enid when yes. he proposed to her. Yes, he was 35, she was 17 when they were married. Yes, and it's interesting reading that Enid's father said to Joe that but for the fact that he was in the position he was and a different religion, he was concerned about yes, the religion. that's right, the But because of his position he was going to say yes, but otherwise his age and his religion would have led yes. Enid's father to say no to the marriage. I think I mentioned in the book that if a marriage like that was muted today, it would be considered scandalous because he was the Minister for Education, 35. She was a staff member in the office, age 17. Right. And I think the sectarianism at that time too is a major thing, although, of course, she solved the problem by converting to Catholicism immediately. Yeah. In yeah. some respects, became more Catholic than him. Yes. <laughs> yeah, indeed, which is often the case with people who indeed. convert. So I wondered if we could talk about the issues Joe Lyon had with his colleagues when he was in the Labor Party, in the Federal Labor Party. So he leaves state parliament, enters the Federal Parliament as the member, and I'm going to get it wrong, Wilmot. Wilmot, yes, which is now Lyons. Appropriately renamed. And, I mean, you were saying before, he doesn't really buy into the Keynesian economic policies. He's concerned about balanced budgets, about high inflation. I mean, we're talking Great Depression era, so these are massive issues that are having real impacts on everyday people and he's pretty concerned about the welfare of everyday people and that seems to be really, if he has a philosophy, it's about the How? welfare of the, the ordinary, welfare. F- the ordinary family. Yeah, um, yeah, very much. And he was a rather nervous figure, very sensitive, and he sincerely felt the sufferings of people in the Great Depression, and was just very keen to try and do something about it. But as I mentioned earlier, he rejected the ideas of Theodorism and those of others that of expanding government spending because he thought that that would simply lead to inflation. Dame Enid later explained his outlook. She said that Joe simply felt that the Australian economy wasn't big enough to experiment and that Australia wasn't rich enough 
to face that danger of inflation. Although, interestingly enough, in his later prime ministership, the amount of money they spent on rearmament was quite astounding. Right. Well, I guess it's the existential threat. If you don't spend it, potentially you have no country anymore. So maybe the cost of the financing of the rearmament was well, he would have he thought so. Yeah. But when he came to Canberra in Scullin's ministry, he was a little bit shocked by some of the partisanship of his Labor colleagues, Mm. just how left wing they were, how stridently unionist they were how contemptuous they were of him as a Tasmanian. He always felt as a Tasmanian to be an outsider. And this is that period when you do get the view of some that here we have a parish pump politician from the potato plots of Tasmania (laughs) who suddenly had greatness thrust upon him. There was a bit of resentment there. They even noticed it, as I mentioned before, when Joe and Enid attended their first Labor conference in Sydney. They were regarded as, you know, rustics and they resented that. Was there a difference in the politics of the Tasmanian Labor Party and its brothers in Yes, Victoria I think it was more moderate, Wales? certainly yeah. more moderate, and there's a much lower Irish element. The Irish population, Catholic population, therefore, in Tasmania was much lower in a percentage point of view than on the mainland. Mm, mm. But he enters federal parliament and is automatically put into the cabinet, yes. isn't he? Yes, he became so, postmaster general, Yes, which based in Melbourne, which was... Oh, this was the was St Kilda about. period. Was yes, it? he was happy about that because it meant fewer trips to Canberra because, of course, these trips to Canberra in those days. For someone from Devonport, it meant crossing the strait at night, then getting on the train from Melbourne to Canberra. You know, it was a monumental journey, so he was quite happy to be based at the post office in Melbourne, near St Francis Church, of course, as it was then. And Postmaster General in those days was a far more important portfolio than one would think today. Right, yeah. Because the means of communication. It was a senior appointment and it did lead to some jealousy within the Labor movement that this outsider, this Tasmanian, this unknown to some people anyway, had become a senior minister. And then, of course, when Scullin was overseas and Theodore was under scrutiny for various scandals, Lyons became the acting treasurer. That also led to considerable resentment. And when Scullin was in England in 1931, James Fenton, a Victorian politician, was the acting prime minister, but it was in the view of many that Lyons was in fact the de facto acting prime minister. Because Fenton was a bit hopeless. Fenton was a bit hopeless, yes. (laughs) And Lyons had also shown by this stage that he was a very good media performer, a very good speaker, on the platform, and a very good speaker on the radio. Which is important in that day and age, pre-television, the radio and newspaper were the key ways to communicate with the masses. So he made a real name for himself nationally at that stage, didn't he? Now, he has this massive falling out with the Scullin government, doesn't he, over Theodore's inflationary ideas and Jack Lang, then Premier of New South Wales, wants to repudiate the debt and Lyons, you've explained before, he had quite a conservative view of of A man of great principle. Hmm. Policies. I mean, he's horrified by this all. He's horrified by the idea of inflation, as I mentioned before, but he's also horrified by these Lang suggestions that Australia's loan should be repudiated. And to Joe, that was just not the way a person operated. He often used examples from personal life that one should meet one's debts, one should live within one's income. He often quoted Charles Dickens, who'd quoted his father, because, of course, Dickens's father had also left his family pretty much in poor financial circumstances. Joe Lyons was keen to quote Dickens, where Dickens said that income... 20 shillings, expenditure, 19 shillings and sixpence is happiness, income, 20 shillings, expenditure, 20 shillings and sixpence is misery. And that's pretty much the way Joe operated. As I say, he was not an intellectual, he wasn't a trained economist, but he had the experience as treasurer, as a treasurer in Tasmania and, of course, federally, and he just was not happy with the idea. His approach to the stresses of the Depression was that people simply needed to make sacrifices in the short term and hence these programs of loan conversion where he engineered a system whereby people voluntarily transferred their loans to a lower level of interest, in the national interest. And of course to many in the left of the Labor Party this was just bourgeois nonsense. Mm. 
What was the basis for Jack Lang's suggestion that the national debt repayment should be repudiated? I mean, was it just because, you know... Lang simply felt that the interest rates were too high and that Australia's national interest was simply we just can't afford to pay these anymore. The, the British banks, chiefly, some American, simply had to cop the fact that Australia just couldn't pay. And, of course, people like Lyons and others were horrified that what this would do to Australia's credit standing in the world. That's right, it's reputation. Huge sovereign risk to have any economic relationship with Australia if that's the way they And, of course, on. Australia, is very, as it still is, very much dependent on foreign debt and so on. And he decides to resign and makes this quite important speech, a watershed speech, and he really sort of goes back to his core beliefs about the concerns of the typical family. He's thinking yes. about the, probably in Stanley, not very much money, just trying to make ends meet, only spending their 19, <laughs> 19, 19 shillings, shillings and, and sixpence, sixpence yes. not their 20 mm. shillings and sixpence. He makes a great appeal, and this, I mean, this speech really goes down incredibly he well, know, doesn't and, it, with the people? Yes. yes. Not his party. A number okay. of his speeches in late 1930, when he's still a, a Labor minister, were noticed, and this is when he starts really travelling around various parts of the country and making these platform speeches about loan conversion and about meeting debt and so on, which leads to a lot of animosity in the Labor Party, of course, then... He doesn't leave the party until March 31 and that's when he makes the speech in federal parliament in which he explains why he's leaving the Labor movement. With great regret, he quotes the Theodore proposers and just finds that they're just beyond his measure. Interestingly enough, he agonised over this whether to withdraw from the party for months. He left the party room and he was still attending caucus meetings in January and February, but he essentially pulled out of the life of the party from, say, January 31. And he agonised for months over what to do until he made the decision with the influence of the group, the so-called group, this group of six influential Melbourne businessmen and politicians, including Menzies. And he resigns from the Labor Party. And within several months, Labor abandoned any ideas of Theodore uh, inflationary proposals and introduces the Premier's plan, which was a measure of moderation. And in the Premier's plan of mid-31, essentially adopted some of the policies that Lyons had been advocating since late 1930, that is, sacrifices of workers, sacrifices of employers and so on. At that time, so in mid-1931, after Lyons has left the party, he's now the leader of the UAP, and he said to Dame Enid, I didn't need to do it. I could have held on and still stayed in the Labor Party. This was something I discovered from some my researchers some years ago. Her view, her response was that, well, if you hadn't left the party, I would have been ashamed of you. And in one of the oral interviews she gave to a Tasmanian journalist in the 1970s, she talked about how Joe had come to regret leaving the party in the first few months after he'd done so. And she said, quote, I straightened him out. <laughs> <laughs> and to me, that is so explanatory. And then by the end of the year, particularly in the election campaign of late 1931, he's stressing the point of view, no, it, what, leaving the party wasn't a mistake. I'm convinced more day by day that I did the right thing. However, there is a lingering element of doubt in his mind right through until his death that perhaps he had made the wrong decision, that perhaps he should have held on. He never said so publicly again. In fact, he never said publicly at all. It's just confided to Dame Enid. But he still, in many circumstances, right through to 1939, described himself as a true Labor man. It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, he's leading, as you say, the United Australia Party, which yes. is you know, the Liberal Party of Australia is the successor party of the UAP. And yet the Prime Minister, the leader of that party, described Still himself, described himself as to a his confidence as a, yeah. as a true Labor man. Shows the flexibility in mm. Australian politics at that time. Yes, and it also Hard shows the flexibility this of the, this concept of this United Australia Party, which well, supposedly is non partisan and supposed to absorb people from all groups of society. Dame Enid would often tell people that uh, she would be approached by uh, former Labor Party members who said that they now voted UAP and she would say to them, well, you are voting for the true Labor Party. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, she was also very flexible by the sounds of it and practical. She was. 
You mentioned the group and Robert Menzies is part of this and this is when Robert Menzies is in the Victorian State Parliament, not the, yes. the Federal Parliament at this stage. I mean, this is quite interesting. They really lobby lines very hard. They obviously see in lines an opportunity to co-opt someone really talented who doesn't buy into the, the sort of socialist ideology of the Labor Party. He's much more malleable and, I mean, in his watershed speech, I really like this quote. He says, I would not like to see them, this is the starving women and kiddies, suffer as thousands of other kiddies in Australia today while we are talking about these visionary schemes, referring to Theodore's mad mad plan. So he's really very focused on this group in society, not ideology. So the group, this group of businessmen and, and Robert Menzies, they are able to do a remarkable thing in converting lines from nice. Labor cabinet minister to leader of a brand new party on the centre right of politics. Yes, well, the group was formed in, as far as we know, towards the end of 1930, and as you say, it consisted of chiefly businessmen and one politician, that is Robert Menzies, one state politician. Now, the leader of the group is a man called Staniforth Rickardson who'd known Lyons in Tasmania. He had been a journalist on The Advocate in Burnie. So he knew Lyons as a state politician. And there were Kingsley Henderson, who was a director of the Argus, who was also a close friend of Lyons. A number of the others were not known to Lyons before. But Menzies, of course, I think Menzies was probably a significant influence on Lyons at the time in the late 1930 because he, of course, was the only politician in this group Mm. who could understand the chance of politics, the stresses of politics, the rigours of politics, the difficulty one would have in changing sides. They noticed Lyons, when Lyons was giving speeches while still acting Federal Treasurer, what a prominent speaker he was, what an interesting character he was. And then, of course, they play an important part in helping him to make that decision to leave Labor. Ambrose Pratt is another one, a leading Melbourne journalist and very close friend of Lyons. He actually wrote Lyons' speech that was supposed to be delivered in the House of uh, Representatives for when he resigned from the party. There's some doubt about whether the uh, speech that Lyons actually gave in March 31 was the one written by Ambrose Pratt, but certainly he had talked to Ambrose Pratt and they discussed what sort of things he ought to say on that occasion. And they seem to have persuaded Lyons, his original intention was to simply leave Labor, become a backbencher, possibly even leave politics. He had also contemplated this after the First World War and had began studying law in Tasmania in the early 20s. Then the Conservative government collapsed and he became Premier, so he set that aside. But he, he had thought of leaving politics these before. two occasions when he genuinely thinks, well, I might just throw it all in and Yes, because go, he was a very... He, so he, he, he was having a great deal, yeah. indeed, were the only place where he really felt at home and where he yeah. felt calm. In fact, in the last week of his life, he said to one of his confidants that I should never have left Tasmania, I should have stayed there. <laughs> but there <laughs> he is. A, is it 11 children he had in the end? 11, yes. 11, so, yeah. what, there were 12, one died early. So there were 11. I think at the time of the Great Depression, I think there were five or six. So it's still, it was a large family. Yes. And he was referred to by uh, some of his opponents as uh, fertile but futile. <laughs> he was fertile, but I don't think he was futile. No. And the group had noticed him, as I say, in late 1930. And I think they played a significant role in early 1930, up to the time of the resignation, in persuading Joe that he had a future on the other side of politics, although he didn't actually see it as being on the other side because he insisted he would never join the Nationalist Party, led by John Latham, that he would only contemplate a significant role in some sort of merged supposedly non-partisan movement as deputy under Latham, but the party would need to have changed its name, it would need to have changed its character. Now, in the end, of course, the members of the group played a significant part in persuading Latham to step down. Some research that I did at the Prime Minister's Centre in Canberra in 2009, I really was able to determine that Latham's common view that Latham voluntarily stepped down from the leadership of the Nationalist Party in favour of Lyons as part of a now fused opposition party, the UAP. That's not the case. He was pushed. He didn't step down voluntarily. Members of the group went to see him on one particular day in his home in Malvern and simply said to him, you've got to go and we're going to form a new party and Lyons will be the leader. And interestingly enough, the Nationalist Party a few days later in Canberra discussed this 
idea of a new leader. Latham stepped down. Lyons wasn't able to go into the meeting because he wasn't a member of the Nationalist Party. He was elected. He became leader of the opposition before he was actually a leader of any party. It's quite an interesting period in Australian history. amazing. And then within a few weeks, this so-called United Australia movement, as he preferred to call it, came into being. But it didn't coalesce until well into 1932. There were still branches in South Australia that refused to call themselves the UAP or the UAM. New South Wales, similarly. And even within Tasmania, there was considerable amount of opposition. I discovered in some research that I did for the Prime Minister's Centre, there was considerable opposition in conservative circles within the Nationalist Party to Lyons being accepted as the leader of a new fused opposition party well, that's hardly because of his Labor background. Of course. <laughs> um, the head of the National, National Union in Tasmania threatened to resign if Lyons was accepted. And this man threatened to stand in Wilmot against Lyons in uh, in the coming federal election, which, of course, that wasn't due until well into 1932, but it came towards the end of 1931 when the Scullin government collapsed because of the Lang group. And he won that election convincingly. It was a landslide. Yeah. But interestingly enough, if you look at the statistics, the Labor vote pretty much was still there as it had been in 1929 and it remained quite stable throughout the 1930s, the Labor vote, the 34 election, the 37 election, although the UAP won quite comfortably all three, but Labor was sabotaged with the Lang Group. It's almost a forerunner of the 1950s in the Democratic Labor Party. Yeah, um, yeah. The Labor vote was split between those two groups to the great benefit of the UAP. And then after 34, Lyons insisted that the country party be brought into a coalition. He didn't need to, but he just, that's once again his idea of consensus. David, I'm interested, as you describe Lyons joining the UAP or the UAM, as he might have preferred to have called it, how much agency he had here. Was he a strategic, scheming, ruthless politician, but presented no. to the public. You know, he was often painted as a koala, wasn't he? Yes, sort of Kind he of was. a nice round face and a bit sort of sweet looking and medium height, a bit chubby. He doesn't appear that way in the way you talk about him. It sort of sounds like he was a useful, almost not puppet, but he was used by the group to achieve their he was, ends. Yes, he was. Interesting enough about the, just about the koala. Just I remember the Treasury was going to introduce a half crown coin in the mid thirties, two and a half shillings, I think, half a crown, with a koala on the front of it, and they decided not to because they thought it looked too much like the prime minister. <laughs> but no, he was not a backroom sort of politician, smoking back room, which is why, of course, he he had many enemies within federal Labor. He tended to leave that sort of thing to other people, such as the group and a number of other politicians when he became Prime Minister. But at the same time, he knew what he wanted and he wouldn't be overridden. As a man of great principle, if he had a particular point of view, he would not abandon that. And this goes right back to his Tasmanian days, even back to the First World War, when he was very anti-conscription and led the campaign in Tasmania against the two conscription campaigns. And in the 1920s as Premier, the expression Della Reining was coined to describe his political technique. Della Reining was the idea that if you make a promise during an election campaign, you must carry it out, you must never uh, resolve from that promise. And Lyons continually stressed that in his federal career as well and it's particularly noticeable in the late 30s when conscription reared its ugly head again and virtually everybody in the federal cabinet was in favour of conscription from 38 onwards. Lyons would not have a bar of it. He said he promised in the 37 election, which is very much a khaki election about defence, that he would not contemplate conscription. And his colleagues tried to persuade him to change his mind. The armed services tried to persuade him to change his mind. He insisted under no circumstances. And the issue was the recruitment for the militia. And Lyons, uh, his opponents said, well, if you're in favour of voluntary recruitment for the militia, it's up to you to attain certain levels of recruitment. And they set figures, 50,000, I think, was the first figure that his opponents set. Try that. Well, he did, and he succeeded and oh. raised even even more. I say, a man of principle who left the backroom politics to other people, but a great speaker, a great campaigner, and, of course, even though issues of discussing his retirement came as early as 1933, 
the power brokers in the party insisted, no, we want Joe to stay because he's such a successful politician and, of course, eventually such an election winner. And even by late 38, when he's a very ill man, Mm. very keen to retire, in his last few weeks in recuperating in Devonport at one stage, and a couple of UAP power brokers visited him in order to persuade him to continue as Prime Minister, and he reluctantly agreed because he was dedicated to his job. But, of course, it cost him his life in the end. He was absolutely intellectually and physically exhausted by the end of 1938. It's amazing to think in in a sort of 10-year period, Australia lost two prime ministers to, you know, ill health yes. in Lyons and then Curtin while they were in the role. You can't imagine that these days, but, I mean, it does happen. How much then was Enid Lyons the kind of power behind the throne then? If Joe wasn't willing to be the backroom negotiator, strategist, cutting deals, if he was prepared to be the electable, affable, earnest... The front man. Front man. Mm. Was Ian at there? Well, she was certainly a great influence on him and he admitted that. This is a forerunner of the Clintons where Bill Clinton, I think at one stage, said that by voting for him you get two in one with <laughs> Bill and Hillary. Yeah. And, of course, there had been precedents. You look for Jimmy Carter and Rosalind, I mean, where she would attend cabinet meetings and things like that. Now, when that happens, often when a politician is greatly influenced by his wife, it's not something that they tend to come to the fore about. Joe was quite open about it, that Enid was his confidant, his most trusted advisor, and he was perfectly open about it in public. One leading journalist in Canberra that time, Alan Reid, later of the Bulletin, said that he was surprised how often he would talk to, to Joe, how often he would mention his wife. And even in in the 1920s, the Sydney Journal Table Talk interviewed him as Premier and they noticed this trait. They referred to him as having a fat, uxorious face. <laughs> and Dame Enid was present during the interview with the Table Talk journalists and they simply noted that she was very much a component of what they called at that time the dinghy of state. And they were quite open about it. He always discussed issues with her didn't always follow her advice. As I say, he regretted the fact that he'd left Labor, at least for some months. She was very important. They gave joint radio broadcasts on a number of occasions in the late 30s, particularly in December 1938, when they were still hoping that the Munich Agreement, about which he had played a major part, they were still hoping that that was uh, relevant. It was disintegrating, of course. That led to some resentment within Cabinet that she was playing too prominent a part when she hadn't been elected to anything. But he was quite open about it. Mm. And she was a very astute political thinker. Oh, and she goes on to be a politician in her own right. She's one of the few surprising factors, the UAP post lines, the thing the party began to disintegrate, that she was able to win a seat in '43 which was very much against the vein of that party at that time. After Lyons' death, the UAP couldn't even hold Wilmot. Oh, there you go. Such was his personal appeal. Mm. Tell me, we were talking before about this, what was the Lyons government legacy, and that some commentators and researchers have said, well, he didn't really have any interest in foreign policy. You've obviously written a book on his appeasement policies and, of course, the policies around rearming Australia. I mean, these are very significant policies oh, yeah, that he was responsible for yes. and, of course, do have a direct impact on our defence posture and foreign policy. So tell me about them, Dave. He took an immediate interest in foreign affairs and I suggested that he was responsible for what I called three Pacific initiatives. The first one was the Australian Eastern Mission in 1934 where Latham, compensation for stepping down from the leadership, of course, became Minister for External Affairs. It's very similar to Hawke and Bill Hayden later. The aim of the Australian Eastern Mission was to travel through what they had started to call the Near East, particularly Japan, and just assess the situation. Lyons originally intended to lead that mission himself, but was persuaded that he really needed to stay as, and because he was federal treasurer as well, to concentrate on the economy. So he sends Latham off on this mission, which is the first sign of appeasement of Japan. And Latham is quite impressed with what he sees in Japan. 
and he's absolutely assured by the Japanese at that time that they are not rearming. They have no interest in areas south of the equator and so on, mostly deceptions. But the British were very much opposed to this eastern mission and Latham came back and said that the issue with Japan, of course, was the occupation of Manchuria and that Japan would not be satisfied until other nations, such as Britain, of course, acknowledged that they had the right to occupy Manchuria, Manchukuo as they called it. And Latham said that in correspondence with Britain, that Britain needed to find a formula to come back and conciliate itself with Japan. I've seen the letters in the archives in London. The response of the Foreign Office in London was simply contempt. One of the officials in the Foreign Office in London simply wrote to the side of one of these letters of Latham. He said, Latham needs to find his own inverted commas, formula, because we're not going to do it. But then Lyons, he can see that Japan is a danger and he couldn't see any issue with recognising the fact that Japan was going to occupy Manchuria. The Moffat, the US Consul General in Sydney, said that he did not meet an Australian politician who was not in favour of Japan occupying Manchuria because the view was... If they're occupied in Manchuria, they won't head south. Mm. Of course, in the end, they did both. And then Lyons comes up with this 1935, this proposal for a Pacific Pact of Non-Aggression. Now, once again, in Britain, they thought this was a bit of a joke. Baldwin, soon to become Prime Minister in 36, was leading the issues of foreign affairs in the 1935 discussions of Dominion Prime Ministers in London. Baldwin just thought the Dominions didn't know what they were talking about and that they had no right to offer counsel in foreign affairs of the empire. And Lyons proposes this idea of a Pacific Pact of non-aggression, which would include Japan, would include Britain, would include the United States. Dismissed in Britain as a fantasy, although Lyons went on to Washington and raised it with Roosevelt. Roosevelt was quite receptive to the idea, but nothing happens. Lyons continues to pursue it in thirty-seven at another imperial conference. Once again, the British offer lip service to it. Nothing comes of it. But nevertheless, it shows you that he was very forthright about Australia's interests. He recognised that there was a divergence of interest between Britain in the Far East and us in our Near East. Yeah. Britain was very supportive of China. Lyons wanted conciliation with Japan. And then the third part of this, and related to the Pacific Pact proposal, is Lyons' view that Australia needs its own diplomatic representation, finally. He'd been opposed to the idea right through to the late 30s, accepted that Australia needed trade commissioners in places like Tokyo and Hong Kong and Singapore, but not diplomatic representation. But by late 38, early 39, he's convinced that Australia does need diplomatic representation in Washington, and Tokyo, and he starts to engineer this. He dies just before it's announced. Who gets to announce it? Menzies. And interestingly enough, Menzies had been opposed to the concept right from day one because he and many other Conservatives believed that this would be a breach of British diplomatic unity. And the view of Menzies and a number of other Conservatives was that Australia should continue to simply lobby in Britain for imperial foreign policy. And yet, as I say, as the new Prime Minister Menzies gets to announce these diplomatic representations, I went to a Liberal Party meeting here some years ago where Josh Frydenberg was praising Menzies for having engineered Australian diplomatic representation. I had to inform him that that was not the case, that it was actually (laughs) lions and that Menzies had been opposed to it. Well, when you get the credit for announcing it, you get a lot of credit, don't you? There's lots to talk about here. I am interested, though, in the issue of appeasing Nazi Germany and the role that Joe Lyons and also Menzies play in that policy, which was – I mean, Anne Henderson's written a lot about this. It was a prevailing view in Australia. So this sort of sense that, oh, well, they were on the wrong side of history and they should have condemned Hitler and not sought to do any deals with Hitler at all is, you know, all very well for us in hindsight, given we know the atrocities that Nazi Germany committed. But – Back then, you've got a population that only a generation before had gone through World War I and just wanted to avoid war at any cost. And the leadership of Australia and other countries was reflective of that, wasn't it? Absolutely. And that's, of course, you make that point that we judge Nazi Germany and the knowledge of what happened during the war and the Holocaust and so on. Well, of course, this hadn't happened in the 1930s. And there's a distinct element of what it's been referred to as Versailles guilt amongst many British and Dominion politicians 
the idea that, and Smuts, of course, first voiced this as early as 1919. South Africa, when he was at the Treaty of Versailles, at the signing of the treaty, Germany had been badly treated. And, of course, someone like Hitler uses this very much to his advantage. Archbishop Mannix suggested that this idea of Versailles guilt, valid though it was, had simply given Germany a bit of a free kick right through the 1930s, that whenever Hitler made some sort of move and territorial acquisition, he always mentioned that it was in breach of the Treaty of Versailles because the Treaty of Versailles, of course, was absolutely repudiated by all Germans, not just the Nazis, of course. And people like Lyons and many British politicians were absolutely terrified of the prospect of another war. Lyons visited the war graves in France in 1935 and 1937, was reduced to tears, and was absolutely convinced that we must do everything we could to prevent that happening again. Germany's claims seemed perfectly reasonable in the 1930s, up at least until early 39, with the issue of the absorption of the rump of Czechoslovakia. The reoccupation of the Rhineland seemed perfectly reasonable. The reintroduction of conscription seemed perfectly reasonable. Britain had in fact breached the Treaty of Versailles itself in 1935 by signing a naval agreement with Germany. Common view amongst many conservative politicians at least was that, okay, dictatorship in Germany, that's fine for Germany, Mm. for our liberal democracies, but if that's what the Germans want, and clearly they did, of course, in the 1930s, then they should be allowed to follow that path. Casey even suggested that it was part of German character. They needed to follow a leader. A similar view was held with about the Italians. Remember, Italy and Japan had been on the Allied side in the First World War, so they weren't viewed as potential enemies until right up until the end of the 1930s. The view was that fascism is fine, admirable in Italy, not applicable to a country like Australia, but mm. if that's what the Italians want. And Lyons, of course, visited Italy on two occasions had interviews with Mussolini on two occasions and was impressed. He also wanted an interview and had arranged an interview with Hitler in 1935, but Hitler cancelled it at the last minute because it was being held in the Rhineland and he just didn't feel that he could make the time for it, although he met Mackenzie King of Canada and met Pierov, the South African Defence Minister. The Germans were very keen at that time to encourage the dominions in their idea of having their own foreign policies and sort of distancing them to some extent from Britain. They, right. Whenever Hitler they were looking spoke to, for wedge, yeah, wedge whenever issues, Hitler spoke to yeah. Dominion politicians, yes. as he did on a number of occasions, that's something that he stressed that this was good, that they should have their own voice. So now, and so obviously Lyons was receptive. To yes, this. absolutely. Yeah. Now he was very concerned about the persecution of Catholics and Jews, of course, which was perfectly evident, particularly after Kristallnacht in November thirty-eight. But his view was that this is an internal German issue that we really should keep our noses out of it. And it came to a fore in January 39 when H.G. Wells was visiting Australia and he made some derogatory comments about Hitler and Mussolini in a radio speech and Lyons was critical of that and said that we shouldn't be interfering in the domestic politics of Germany and that insulting Hitler was the equivalent of a German politician insulting King George VI. And H.G. Wells just thought this view was ridiculous, but that really sums up the attitude of an appeaser like Lyons was this idea that we've got to really do everything we can to prevent another world war. And of course for Australia, at many of these imperial meetings, particularly in 37, when the Czech issue was coming to the fore, it was very easy for politicians like Lyons and Earl Page and others to accept, well, why not give Germany the Sudetenland? I mean, we didn't give a damn about what happened to Czechoslovakia particularly. Over the Chamberlain view, a faraway country of which we know nothing, well, it was even further away well, from that's Australia. Right. Yeah. Earl Page said this at one meeting in London, well, if that's the Germans want the Sudetenland, give it to them. And then it was pointed out to him that the Sudetenland had never been part of Germany, <laughs> of which he was unaware. But this is right through in the Munich crisis. Lyons is lobbying Chamberlain, not that Chamberlain needed much lobbying to this effect, make concessions, do anything you can essentially to avoid war. Lyons played a major part in debates before the Munich settlement. He was telephone conversations with Chamberlain, telegrams. Many of these had been dismissed by earlier historians as not being able to have reached Britain in time. I looked at these telegrams and so on and the transcripts of these phone conversations in London where the time was noted 
they were there. They were able to be read in time, and some historians had made an error about British summertime. But the timing was wrong. These cables were reached in time to be read in the British Cabinet, and more importantly, on the morning of 28th of September, I think it was, Lyons actually telephoned Chamberlain the very last minute and suggested to him that Chamberlain send cables to Mussolini to act as a mediator. And I have seen the Chamberlain uh, papers in Birmingham. I saw the handwritten notes by Chamberlain where Chamberlain wrote the transcript of the phone conversation with Joe Lyons on that morning and by 11 o'clock that morning, Chamberlain had sent the cable to Mussolini, intervene as an intermediary and the wording of the cable, I think he sent the carbon copy basically to Hitler, the wording was almost exactly that of the phone conversation of Joe Lyons that morning. Oh, how extraordinary. Lyons never mentioned this in public, but it explains why he felt that he was very much responsible in part for the Munich Agreement and was bitterly disappointed when it broke down several months later. But this, he felt, was the climax of his of appeasement. And an appeasement, of course, at that time was not a dirty word. It was something that People they boasted wanted. about. Yes. The initial term they used was a marvellous word coined by the British Foreign Office called cunctation, from the Latin cunctari, to delay, which was the, a policy of delaying contact with aggressors like Hitler and later Mussolini and the Japanese until there was the right moment. And then, you see, appeasement is the next step. Now, you don't delay. You actually step in and make some proposals, make some concessions. And, of course, as we know in politics, it's very easy to make concessions when those concessions are at the expense of someone else. Well, indeed, yes. And as you said, you know, some of the Australian leaders at the time didn't even know the territory exactly. they were talking about. of course. About. David, I did want to get on to the menzies lions relationship, which deteriorated pretty badly towards the end of 38, ending in Menzies resigning, but he had started to give some speeches that were very critical of the lack of national leadership in Australia, which of course was directed at Lyons, but without naming him. Menzies is in the Lyons cabinet, so this is pretty shocking <laughs> that Menzies was going around saying this publicly in speeches. How did Lyons and Menzies get along up until that point? I mean, he'd obviously been close in the early 30s, getting Lyons to leave the Labor Party to join the UAP, but towards the end it's uh, all deteriorated. Well, Joe was clearly impressed with Lyons in late 30, early 31, as when he met him as a member of the group. He was very supportive of uh, Menzies taking uh, the seat of Kuyong after Latham retired in 34. For the 34 election in September, the actual election date was Lyons' birthday. And he recognised that Menzies, as did everybody, that Menzies was a man of great ability, Attorney General, of course, then. And he was quite happy to allow Menzies to help him in drafting cables to England, to London on uh, various matters of foreign affairs. Accompanied Menzies, of course, to England in 35 for the meeting of Dominion Prime Ministers. Their views differed a little. Menzies was still rather sceptical about taking a rosy view of Germany and Menzies actually at one meeting of Dominion Prime Ministers disagreed with the South African Prime Minister who suggested that Germany's intentions were quite honourable and that we were being overly sensitive by suggesting that Germany was belligerent. Menzies expressed his scepticism about that. And clearly Joe trusted him and I discovered, and no one else has ever mentioned this, that in 1936, during the Rhineland crisis, Menzies was en route to the UK for trade talks and Lyons actually suggested to Baldwin that he use Menzies as an intermediary with Germany during this Rhineland crisis. Wow. It's sort of a forerunner of the Suez crisis of yes. the 56. By the time... Equally uh, unsuccessful. Indeed, indeed. And by <laughs> the, he didn't even tell me, he didn't ask Menzies whether he wanted to do this. He simply cabled to Baldwin and suggested it. He also suggested that Baldwin may want to use Stanley Bruce as well, but there'd been a bit of a disagreement between Bruce and Lyons over how to handle the Rhineland crisis, so that's when Joe suggests Menzies. But by the time Menzies landed in London, the Rhineland crisis had been resolved, so nothing came of it. And as far as I know, Menzies was never informed of this, but it does indicate the incredible amount of trust that Joe had for him. But there was a Damien in her memoirs. She mentions that 
Joe had reservations about certain parts of Mendes' personality. Right. That he was unduly arrogant, that he wasn't particularly considerate of the outlook of his colleagues. She suggested that Joe believed that Mendes would moderate his behaviour and that when he did so, he would make an excellent Prime Minister. And, of course, then we get this issue. How soon was it that Menzies viewed himself as the heir apparent? Was it from no one knows, of course. It's a forerunner of Hawke and Keating and Howard and Costello, this idea that someone holds the view that they are the heir apparent, that they've been promised by the incumbent that I will step down at a certain period of time and then you can take over. Now, certainly in the 1930s, no one had put anything in writing. There's no record of this. So we don't really know how soon Menzies had come to assume that he was the heir apparent, but certainly by the mid-30s, that's the way it was seen, certainly by 1938. Yeah. But the falling out came, of course, in late 38, when the hint starts to appear that the national insurance scheme that they'd been planning since 32 simply could not go ahead in its full form because of the amount that they're expending on defence. Uh, Lyons had presided over five rearmament programs. A sixth was mooted, and at one stage, the 1938-1939 budget, 18% of the budget was devoted to rearmament. Wow. Now, if 18% of a national budget for defence is not rearmament, I don't know what is. And that's another common myth, which I think I've helped to dispel, is that, that Lyons didn't spend money on defence forces. He did. And then... In March 38, of course, it's announced that's it. We can't simply go ahead with this national insurance scheme and it's in full Menzies resigns from Cabinet and in the same week as the Germans absorb the rump Czech state, the Australian press highlighted the Menzies resignation at the expense of what was happening in Europe. But then, of course, within a few weeks, within a month, Lyons was dead. Yeah. And despite Earl Page's opposition, Menzies becomes Prime Minister. Now, they had the falling out... But even then, even in March 39, Joe had said to Enid that we can get by without Menzies, but he had no animosity towards him, no personal animus towards Menzies, still had very high regard for him, still believed that he had a, quite a future. And that's typical of Joe. He was not a man of great animosity. Now, to go back to that speech in late 38, July 38, Menzies goes to Nazi Germany. He's impressed with some aspects. Yes. Not everything, some and once again, we have to judge that in the light of this is pre-Kristallnacht and pre what happened in World War II, of course, pre-Holocaust and so on. He's impressed with some characteristics, impressed with the economy, impressed with the spirit that he finds in Germany, the enthusiasm, the patriotism. This was a common enough view amongst many politicians, even the state, very left-wing state Labor Premier of Tasmania, Albert Ogilvie, who visited Germany at the same time, very similar experience. Now, he comes back from Germany, writes articles in the Argus and makes that speech at the Constitutional Club in October where he praised that spirit that he found in Germany and the quality of the leadership and suggested that we would do well in the democracies, not just Australia, to sort of have the same quality of leadership. Now, there's some dispute about whether this is taken as an attack on Lyons' leadership. Joe didn't think so. Enid did. Yes. And she describes in her memoirs of the breakfast following that Constitutional Club address. Joe's quite happy. She points out the view of the newspapers that this is largely an attack on his leadership. He's quite relaxed about it. No, I don't think so. I think it's just the way the press are interpreting. And she didn't use the same terms as in 1931 where I straightened him out, but it's the same characteristic there. She straightened him out. <laughs> she bore a resentment about that speech. And to say she wasn't alone. Earl Page felt the same thing, which explains Earl Page's hostility to Menzies becoming Prime Minister in early 39. She nursed that grudge for that grievance for decades. And in 1972, there's a series of correspondence between her and Menzies, who was hospitalised at that time, where she simply said, you attacked his leadership, you were in part responsible for his early death because he suffered greatly from that, which is a bit of an exaggeration, but nevertheless... Yes, because he'd been in poor health before yeah, that. exactly. Yeah. And Menzies denied it, and they agreed to disagree. But it's something that she nursed for decades, and there's a resentment between Damien and Menzies from 1938 onwards that lasts right through even her period as a federal member, where she also felt that... And that, part of his government, too. Yeah, she felt that Menzies sort of downplayed her role earlier and in 
while she was a Member of Parliament and that Menzies had sort of tried to prevent her from rising to the top of the party leadership. There's a resentment there from late 38. Now, some people disagree about whether that was the case, but the important point is that she certainly believed that and she influenced Joe probably to come to the same conclusion. And when, as I mentioned, when uh, Menzies resigned in March 39, Joe's comment was, well, we can get on without him. But as I say, in his case, there was no animosity. Which was really true to his character. And I should note, we're recording this on the 27th of April. Menzies was sworn in as Prime Minister on the 26th of April, 1939. So taking over, of course, from Joe Lyons. So it's notable, the timing of our discussion. David, this has been a wonderful discussion and I know we could go on further, but we should wrap it up and encourage people to get your book and read more about Joe Lyons, who was such an important Prime Minister in Australia's history for many reasons, not least he was someone who moved between political parties, but he did make an enormous contribution to a period that unfortunately is a little eerily similar these days in terms of preparing for a potential great war, a great conflict, and we shouldn't forget the contribution he made to preparing Australia for, for That's the right, period Mike. 1939. Yes, almost. one of my conclusions was that he left the country in a better cert than he found it and prepared for war. This is another myth that one often finds that Australia was not ready for war, but it was. And interestingly enough, a, a man of who was almost a pacifist was the one who did it, and he did it because he just felt that that's what Australia needed. He also closed his career with the observation that no one was more miserable at the end of his prime ministership than they had been at the beginning, and that he and Enid had basically saved the country from the stresses of the Great Depression. Well, on that note, thank you for your contributions and thank you for bringing that to our attention and uh, giving us a greater understanding, David Byrne. Thank you. That's it for this week's episode of Afternoon Light, the podcast of the Robert Menzies Institute. Please make sure to subscribe and catch up on our latest online content on our website or on Twitter, LinkedIn or Facebook. 